Hey everyone, if you're a longtime listener, you might recognize this episode as one we did many years ago when we first read Dune by Frank Herbert on this podcast, but we are actually remastering and re-releasing the entire Dune book club series for new fans who are diving into the books after having watched Denny Villeneuve's blockbuster films. So whether you are a longtime fan and you're re-listening to this series, or if you're a new listener who just picked up the book for the first time and are looking for a spoiler-free guide through the world of Dune, we welcome you, and we're so excited that you're here. Thank you so much for listening. Now, let's have a look at you, lad. You've made a Dune podcast before. This is the first time. Then someone did the editing for you. No. Your waveforms are lined up with neat crossfades to hide edits, Who told you to do that? It seemed the right way. That it most certainly is. Welcome to Gamjabar, your guide to the iconic world of Dune. We'll be exploring the themes, philosophies, and characters found in the sandy depths of this vast universe, from Frank Herbert's groundbreaking novels to the adaptations on film and TV. My name is Leo. And my name's Abu. We are back with episode two of Gamjabar Book Club! Book Club! Gamjabar Book Club! (laughs) It's exciting. Baby! I feel like this is, this maybe feels like the first real episode kind of does that make sense yeah no that totally makes sense i mean the first one was intro we were kind of getting our toes wet with it so to speak not to waste water but (laughs) it was uh the first one didn't feel real now it feels real and things in the book are also definitely getting real so we are making our way through this book and it's happening it's happening uh reminder that we're going to be covering the entirety of the first book in preparation for Denis Villeneuve's upcoming film, which is getting closer week by week. Hopefully. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yes. If you have just now stumbled upon Gam Jabbar and this is the first episode you clicked play on and you're really, really confused, <laughs> you should be. Hi. <laughs> this is part two of our book club. Yeah. Hello. First of all, hi. <laughs> Second of all, this is part two of our Dune book club. So you're missing an entire part one if you haven't read the book yet. You want to start there, get a copy of the book, follow along, and we encourage you to reach out to us and connect with us at gamjabarpodcast at gmail.com because we want to include your voices, your thoughts, and your opinions in this Dune book club. And no spoilers. Again, this is probably a very important question on the forefront of your mind. We are going to be taking this book about 100 pages at a time and... Abu and I are going to do our very best. We're going to, we promise, we are not going to spoil anything past the pages that we've discussed already, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And again, our mission with this Dune book club is if you are a first time reader, to make your first time even more enjoyable and be your expert guides through this immense, immense world. And if you are a returning reader and a longtime Dune head, we want to be your expert guides and reveal some of the expanded lore tidbits or things you might have missed on your first, second, or third read. Yeah. We want to be here providing you some expert deep dive knowledge. Indeed. So as a book club, we are excited to feature some messages that we've actually gotten from the first episode of the book club. Yeah, people have reached out to us after hearing the first book club episode. A lot of positive feedback. And as we asked our wonderful listeners to do, many of you wrote in questions and many of you wrote in your thoughts as you're reading along with us. So we love that for you. We love that for us. (laughs) And before we jump into the meat of today's discussion and the chapters that we're covering today, we wanted to take a few minutes and answer some mailbag questions that we've gotten from our dear listeners. So first up, we have a Twitter DM. From Kim Chi Gal. 
So the message reads, Hi, Abu. And I'm not going to take that personally. Uh, hi, Abu. Really enjoying the podcast and book club. Have a spice question. How did some non-natives who lived on Arrakis avoid spice addiction when it's in everything? Examples, Raban, Gurney, Fenring. I'm only on the first book, but I haven't seen any of them described with the blue eyes. I'm sure there's a simple explanation that I missed somewhere. Thanks. Well, thank you, Kim Chi Gal. Love the message, yeah. and it's a great question, and one that doesn't have as simple of an answer as you might think. There's a little bit of ambiguity, but let's talk about it. Yeah, for sure. This is kind of a multifaceted question, and we're going to be going out on a limb on the answer here just a little bit. But the first thing I want to bring up here is the names that Kim Chi Gao mentions. Raban, Gurney, Fenring. The three of them all have something in common. They are wealthy, yep. comfortable, <laughs> and privileged people. Yeah. Or they're adjacent to very wealthy, comfortable, privileged people and thus themselves reap those rewards. Right, right. And what that means is that their diets can be diverse, even if they are on Arrakis, right? They're not bound to only eat the spice filled delicacies of the planet. Right. They don't have yeah. to go to the Arrakis Starbucks and get the <laughs> spice filled jelly donut. They can get an off-world jelly donut if they want. They can have that imported or maybe the cooks and chefs in the palace can make them something that isn't imbued with spice. They have that privilege and ability to sort of balance their diets in a way that isn't so spice heavy that they'll get addicted. They can sort of control their spice intake in a way that maybe the average citizen of Arrakis cannot. Right. We also see a scene, and it hasn't happened yet for us in the book club, so I'll be very vague in the way that I talk about it, but we see food items throughout this book that are not from Dune, that are brought from, say, Caladan, or brought from Kaitan, or brought from Seleucus Secundus. We see food items that are brought, and there's a dinner scene where we see some of these items described in detail, and there's actually a terminology, the Imperium explanation of the addictiveness of spice that is worth putting all of this into context. Mm -hmm. Quote, the spice, chiefly noted for its geriatric qualities, is mildly addictive when taken in small quantities, severely addictive when imbibed in quantities above two grams daily per 70 kilos of body weight. That's... That's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of spice. That's a lot. And it can be a little hard to tell how much exactly that is. But let's think about a real world analogy because I, I have a little bit of trouble with like, I don't know how much a gram is. So CBD oil, which is not exactly, the, it's not spice. <laughs> it's not, it's not spice, <laughs> but no, no geriatric properties <laughs> as far as I know, as far as I know, maybe we need to up our intake. Uh, <laughs> So let's take that as an example. You've recently arrived on uh, Brooklyn, Arrakis, and you're going to get a cup <laughs> on of... On Williamsburg, the planet. <laughs> Williamsburg, the Can planet. you imagine? <laughs> what a hellhole of a planet. <laughs> <laughs> Williamsburg's great, but yeah, it's, it would also be terrible for so many reasons. Uh, yes, you're, you're on Williamsburg, the planet, and you roll up to a counter and you have... You just order a coffee because you're like, you're an off-worlder. And they're like, here's your CBD coffee. Are you going to get addicted on a CBD coffee? No, no, because the amount is really, really small. In an yeah. average cup of coffee, commonly around five milligrams of CBD is added. Right. <laughs> so little. Now, to put that in perspective, if we're using the two gram daily measurement of right. spice addiction, <laughs> yeah. you would have to drink daily <laughs> over 400 cups of of CBD coffee to become addicted, to become severely addicted. Now, I know some people who could do that. I'm not saying that's not possible. I've gotten close. <laughs> but that just sort of puts that two gram number in perspective, I think. Again, just to be super clear about this, Leo and I are speculating. There is no right. concrete. Sure. Like Frank did not do the math for us and did not lay out the economy and diets of the people of Arrakis. So we don't have a super clear-cut answer, 
But based off of him speculating, based off of what we do know, that's probably the best answer that we can come up with there is that they're privileged. They can mix and match their diets and control how much spice they intake. And also based off of the terminology of Dune, it takes quite a bit of spice intake every single day to become severely addicted. You're probably going to be okay if you're just mildly addicted to melange. Absolutely. Thank you, Kimchi Gal, for the question. Let's move on to an email from Viresh. Do you plan on carrying the book club to Chapter House? That would be fantastic. Wouldn't it be fantastic? <laughs> it would be so fantastic. I would love to. At the moment, we are pretty much only aiming to get through this first novel before the movie comes out because, honestly, it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. uh, weekly episodes is, is a lot. But we do want to talk about it all. Again, Frank's words are so much fun to pour over. And even though this is only the second episode of the book club, I'm having an absolute blast. So I'm sure we will at some point, but there aren't any concrete plans yet. Yeah, we, we haven't put a ring on it. We haven't committed <laughs> to anything quite yet. For now, the only thing that we're committed to is getting through this first massive novel before the movie comes out in preparation for the movie. But like you've said, Leo, we likely will tackle future books and future episodes. And a lot of that actually depends on how all of you like these episodes, the reception that we get for this first book club that covers the first novel. If people really love it and really want more book club episodes, then of course we'll do them. So totally, that's an yeah. important factor here for us is the feedback that we get from our listeners. So if you like these book club episodes and you want us to cover more books in the future, email us, DM us, let us know. And spread the word about Gam Jabbar. Again, easier for us to commit to this if we have a lot of people listening. <laughs> that's kind of right. the, that's the point. Abu for and I sure. will talk off mic about those six books until the cows come home. Oh, yeah. Getting it on microphone is a little bit more work. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So. Okay, let's take a quick ad break, but stick around, dear listener, because we will be right back with the summary. We'll see you in a minute. Okay, then, with that out of the way, let's dive into what we're going to cover today. So today's chapters were from page 106 to 204 yes. in the paperback copy of the book. We have about 100 pages to cover and as always, we are going to start with a quick, quick summary <laughs> yeah. of these 100 pages, and then we'll dive into our three key takeaways from this section, and we'll wrap up with some deep dive, nitty gritty lore nuggets that you might have missed. Let's get into it. So chapter, we'll call it nine. There aren't chapter numbers, but listen, we stopped <laughs> at eight, so this one's nine. Paul is attacked by a remote control hunter seeker. He has to risk his life to save the shout out Mapes, shout out to shout out, who in exchange <laughs> is like, yo, you saved my life. Word on the street is there's a traitor among you. The Fremen know. And we're not really sure who. Meanwhile, like 14 feet over is <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Yui just like sweating <laughs> immensely. In the next room, like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, oh fuck, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. <laughs> Moving on to chapter 10, yeah. Jessica finds a secret room in the palace. Now, this is a tropical room containing tropical plants and full of an abundance of water on this desert planet of Dune. Now, in this room, she finds a hidden message from Margot Fenring, who yep. is another fellow Benny Jesuit. And this warning tells Jessica that there will be an attempt on Paul's life. Lo and behold... Paul joins her in this room after said attempt with the hunter seeker and they barricade while the security forces try to track down who was piloting the hunter seeker. The security forces do find somebody with the controller to the hunter seeker, but it turns out he gets killed in the attempt to arrest him. Quote from an Atreides guard, sorry, my lady, <laughs> we messed him up catching him. He died. He died. End quote. <laughs> Fire that security guard. Oops. Paul and Jessica. <laughs> Paul and Jessica then discuss who the traitor could be and explicitly rule out the traitor, as we the reader know, Dr. Yui. They're brilliant. Oops. <laughs> Chapter 11 starts. 
Leto greets Gurney, definitely fucks Halleck as he comes in Mm -hmm. with the last wave of Atreides' troops. Leto delegates some logistical tasks, and we get a sense of him as kind of a tactician and his shrewdness as he's sort of giving his instructions to uh, to Gurney and to like his propaganda core. And this whole section, he's sort of repeating this phrase, they have tried to take the life of my son. And we really get a sense of his protectiveness and love for Paul. All righty. Chapter 12 is a beefy one. So yes. let me try and break it down. Yeah. Paul and Leto talk about Thufir dropping the ball on security after that attempt on Paul's life. Paul, surprisingly, defends Thufir here because Leto is enraged and ready to fire the guy. <laughs> yeah, he's so mad. And when Thufir arrives with resignation letter in hand, <laughs> yeah. Leto actually uses this as a brilliant opportunity to reinforce Thufir's loyalty to Leto and show us once again what an excellent leader and tactician he truly is. Yeah. Then the big staff meeting starts and everyone else arrives. And we hear some specifics on the logistics of statecraft here on planet Dune. We hear about how the shields can't be used in the deep desert. We hear about the information that House Atreides has gathered so far on the Fremen, which, as we talked about in part one, is critical to Leto's plan here on Arrakis. And then we also talk some finances, which we're going to dive into a little bit later on. Right. Near the end of the meeting, Duncan, also fucks Idaho, enters. (laughs) Yeah, he does. And nearly shows the entire room a Chris knife. Oh, don't do that. (laughs) But don't do that, sir, please. But before he can, luckily, the Fremen leader Stilgar, our first introduction to Stilgar, (laughs) enters and he stops Idaho from taking the knife out and showing everybody. Duncan then agrees to a dual allegiance to both the Fremen and to his duke, Leto. And it's clear that the Fremen here are huge fans of Duncan. They already are inviting him to their parties. And uh, (laughs) frankly, who can blame them? Like, this guy's fucking great. (laughs) We gave him a knife. We love him. He's wonderful. And this chapter winds down with the end of the meeting and Paul reflecting on the Reverend Mother's fateful words about his father. Now, chapter 13 is Leto and Thufir Hawat, the Mintat, and they are discussing the traitor. Thufir tells Leto of the Harkonnen note, which is, of course, part of the Harkonnen plan. They're like, oh, hope mm-hmm. they get this note, and, uh, and hinting at Jessica's betrayal. Leto then returns to the conference room. Paul is sleeping adorably, like on the table under a, bl- uh, under a coat. It's like kind of sweet, actually. And then he has this kind of quiet moment alone on the balcony. And uh, I love the, like, unnamed security guard there who earns his, like, SAG speaking card (laughs) with a speaking role. (laughs) Just gets to say one thing. Doesn't even get a name. He's just like, that's not bad. (laughs) Amazing. Get your bag, my guy. Yeah. Earn it. Get that bag. (laughs) Okay. Chapter 14. Leto. This one's a short one, but such a great one. Leto talks to Paul and sets his own plans within plans. So the gist here is that Duke Leto is going to pretend that he thinks Jessica is the traitor, but he wants Paul to know the truth. Just in case something happens to Leto and he dies, he wants Paul to be able to tell Jessica that her lover never had any doubt. What a sweet thought and what a tragic thought. Yeah. Chapter 15, wrapping up our section, we meet Dr. Kynes, planetologist, ecologist, hell yes. Yeah. Now, we know the emperor has ordered Dr. Kynes, uh, who is acting as the judge of change, kind of overseeing the transfer of the planet from House Harkonnen to House Atreides. He's been ordered to betray House Atreides, and he starts off the chapter not really digging them. He's like, ugh, these assholes but uh, comes around <laughs> comes around by the end of the chapter. It's a quick, yeah. it's a quick pivot. Um, <laughs> he's clearly heard these kind of rumors of Paul being the chosen one, the Kwisatz Haderach, right, that we learned about in the first couple of pages. And mm-hmm. he's, like, trying to remain skeptical this whole time, but, like, throughout the chapter, Paul is not making it easy. He's wearing the suit perfectly. He's asking mature questions. He's, like, being a badass the whole time. And Kynes just every time is like, fuck, this guy's clearly the chosen one. Damn it. (laughs) I think this whole book's about this guy. 
Dang. <laughs> now, Leto flies them. Again, badass, you know, Duke isn't going to let someone else fly his ornithopter. To the spice harvester factory, he spots the worm sign. He's got sharp eyes, this Duke. When the carryall, which is this big winged ship that is supposed to kind of snatch the spice harvester away from the upcoming worm, is determined to be missing, Leto improvises a plan to save the spice workers. Spice be damned, right? Get rid of the spice. Mm -hmm. We're, we're, we're saving the people. Right. We get to see a sandworm consume an entire harvester factory. Absolutely iconic moment. Iconic. Ugh. So good. And again, Kynes, despite his imperial orders to betray House Atreides, is won over very much so by Duke Leto Atreides being kind of an all-around solid dude and certified chill guy. <laughs> Yeah, and the chapter literally ends on the words, I like this Duke. I like this Duke. He is all and that's, right. And that's where our section today ends. What, what, a, what a 180 oh my God. for our guy, yeah. Dr. Kynes. And we're going to talk about it. Duke Leto is a big part of our takeaway section coming up here. Right. And by the end of it, we hope that you, dear listener, also like this Duke. He's pretty great. Okay, we're going to take a quick break here, but stick around. We'll be right back. So let's talk about some of these important details and jump into our key takeaways from this section. Takeaway number one, Arrakis. Woo, it's got some secrets. This is not only the most important planet in the galaxy. I mean, again, this is the sole source of Spice Melange, which flies ships and keeps people alive it's an important place that a lot of people don't know a lot about other than like it's super tough you know yeah super super tough i mean we're talking like salty spittoon <laughs> doesn't have shit on arrakis oh my god yeah. this is one of the toughest planets in the galaxy welcome to the salty spittoon how tough are you how tough am i how tough am I? I had a bowl of nails for breakfast this morning. <laughs> yes, so? Without any milk. Uh, right this way. Sorry to keep you waiting. And like you were saying, it's made clear in these hundred pages that a lot about this planet is either unknown or intentionally kept opaque. Right. And particularly knowledge about the spice. People don't seem to know much about it. Like, can you imagine just not knowing where the most valuable substance in the galaxy comes from or how it is produced? Like, clearly there's hints here throughout this chapter that Dr. Kynes knows more about the spice than he's letting on. Yeah. But even someone as powerful as Duke Leto of the great house Atreides of the Empire is like basically clueless about, about the spice and is asking Dr. Kynes all these questions about the ecology of Dune. At one point, he's like, is that an eagle? Are there eagles on Arrakis? Yeah. And it's like, whoa, guy, dude. This is your planet now. <laughs> I do not know that. <laughs> right. <laughs> did, you read, did you read the memo? Did you read the report on this planet? There's like a brochure that you get when you move to Arrakis. You didn't read that guy who runs the planet? <laughs> well, to be fair, the... Tourist brochure for Arrakis is just a blank piece of paper with sand in oh, it. Oh, yes, so... that's covered. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we can't blame him. Oh, but suffice, suffice it to say that... <laughs> right. Oh, no, sand. Suffice <laughs> it to say, if you're in a relationship with Arrakis, there are some concerning red flags. So red flag number one, Leo. The Fremen. There's... What are they? Who are they? Where? Where? How many? <laughs> There's so many questions. <laughs> now, a lot of the mystery around the Fremen is because, of course, the Harkonnens, who have had the planet for a long time, and also clearly the Emperor, have just yeah. fully written them off as just, oh, some people who play out in the sand. You know, they're yep. uncivilized, yep. barbaric, you know, typical, just like it's ignorant, but like aggressively ignorant. And the only reason, really, that House Atreides knows anything is Duncan also definitely fucks Idaho. Yeah. He's sent as an advance party to a Fremen siege where he's basically living among the Fremen. And as, you know, Stilgar makes clear, they love him. <laughs> they love this guy. He's great. So even like a very basic question of 
we are now inheriting a mostly desert planet, which has desert inhabitants. And you go, cool, how many? They're like, I don't know. Uh, I mean, Duncan was in one of their sieges and he has, he kind of yields for them the answer, like 10,000 in that siege. And then that there are, quote, a great many such CH communities, which, great. <laughs> Love that exact scientific number. Just a great many right. of many, many people. <laughs> right. And, and you you know my guy. And no, no shade against Duncan, right? Right. He's great. We, no, we love Duncan He's on great. this podcast. No shade against him. But you know my guy is ballparking that number hard. <laughs> yeah. Like, he does not know... 10,000? How are you supposed to, like, guess 10,000 people? He's holding his thumb at eye level, looking at a room of crowded people going, uh, 30? 10K. More than 30. Okay. A million. Less than a million. Okay. Somewhere in between. What's another number I know? (laughs) Right, right. Basically, nobody knows how many Fremen exist. Right. These people that are so critical. And I'll, and I'll, I want to emphasize this point, actually, in particular. Yeah. These people that are so critical to Leto's gamble here on the planet. We talked about the Harkonnen plot and Leto's huge, huge risk that he's taking by coming to Arrakis and relying on the Fremen. This gamble that he's staking the future of his entire house and his family on is about a group of people <laughs> that he knows nothing about. Yeah. Like their culture, their rituals, their history, it's all shrouded in mystery. And we see such a clear example of that in the interaction with Stilgar, where Stilgar spits on the table. Right. Yeah. And everyone's like, oh, why'd he do that? <laughs> right. On Arrakis, that's a sign of respect. Right. Giving up your body's water, giving up that much water as a thank you to someone else, that's a huge sign of respect on a planet where water is everything, where water is life and death, and they don't even know that. It's absolutely wild. Like, the Fremen are one of the biggest mysteries of Arrakis, and it's insane, and shows us how desperate Leto is that he is staking his entire future on these people he knows nothing about. Yeah, and, you know, even, so, the one of the other mysteries is smugglers, right? And this is kind of tied to the Fremen as well. He ba- he's basically like, yeah, there are smugglers, obviously. And everyone's like, oh, what? I didn't know that. Yeah, <laughs> there are smugglers. And he's like, they can do whatever they want. We're not going to fight them. We're not going to, you know, whatever. Well, they'll just have to tithe. They'll just have to give some of their, you know, a ducal tithe. And that's great. But even that there are smugglers and even that they have a relationship with the Fremen is like, brand new information to the duke in this chapter where they've they're on arrakis now and the idea of like there are smugglers what and also they're working with the fremen whose culture and again i don't even know if there are birds on this planet let alone what their yeah. culture of the people who live there are yeah and again it, it just speaks to that level of ignorance in the empire yeah about the Fremen and how they operate. And I would add that it also sort of reeks of supremacy, like this idea that the Fremen are just not worth knowing about, oh, like totally. that they're yeah. backwards nobodies, right? Yeah. It just reeks of like, I don't know, why would we bother learning about these people? Aren't they just like backwards desert natives? Like right. what are they? And it's shocking that they would actually be cunning enough to be dealing with smugglers and operating uh, you know, this like underground finance operation with the smugglers. Like, again, it, it, there's a lot of discrediting the Fremen here. And to Leto's credit, he's trying to undo that. Right. You know, he's trying right. to learn more about them. He's trying to connect with the Fremen to incorporate them. Obviously, he's kind of got an end goal in mind there. There's there's an ulterior motive. Sure. But to his credit, he's trying more than anyone in the Empire ever has to this point. <laughs> Shocking. Now, another mystery here on Arrakis is the non-existence of weather satellites. So we can we can assume through some of the dialogue that paying for weather control satellite technology of some sort seems fairly normal. Right. Yeah. In the Dune universe. 
And it's a suggestion that actually comes up at this team meeting with Duke Leto. And the fear Hawad is like, no, I'm sorry, Duke, that's a no go. Right. And it, this this option is basically entirely shut down and shot down because the Spacing Guild, who operate these weather satellites, will not negotiate. They simply will not come to the table and basically tell Hawat and anyone else who approaches them, specifically about Arrakis, to install weather satellites there, that no matter how rich they get, no matter how powerful they get, they simply will never be able to afford this. It is off the table no weather satellites are allowed on Arrakis. And that begs the question, Leo, why? Yeah. <laughs> it's like such a natural thing to have on a planet where, again, as Paul learned in the room with Yui, there are crazy storms that will like whip sand enough to cut bone and metal. And you'd think a space-based way of monitoring those storms would be pretty heckin' helpful, but nope, not even, like, orbiting a, a frigate, right? Like, Gurney Halleck's like, we can put a ship up there. That's fine. We've got ships. Just orbit one. And no, the Spacing Guild's like, no, definitely not. Yeah, so there's something going on here. And moving on, there are other technological limitations of this planet, which are mysterious. <laughs> like... Of course, okay, so there are the multiple conversations about shields. Mm -hmm. Shields really, really matter. And apparently, in the desert, shields are dangerous, right? Quote, a body-sized shield will call every worm for hundreds of meters around. It appears to drive them into a killing frenzy. Yikes. Why? <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> why that? Well, no one really knows. Uh... There's also a sense of, like, the Fremen don't really take the shield seriously. And one character ponders, do they have a way of nullifying shields? Like, what's what's that lackadaisical attitude about? But also, very basically, you know, Leto is saying, you know, we're going to monitor all of the Atreides working men, Apple air tags, and every person's collar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll track them that way. Uh, and then Dr. Kynes is like, you know what? Good on you, caring where your guys are and wanting to make sure they're safe. But uh, sorry to tell you, static electricity from sandstorms masks out many signals. So <laughs> too bad. Tough shit. The desert's a, a dangerous place for electronics, apparently. Right, right. And I, I will say, again, this speaks to a certain level of ignorance that the Atreides are coming onto the planet with. Like, they're shocked that shields don't work in the desert they're they're kind of taken aback by this and our boy duke leto kind of breaks out in a sweat like what <laughs> yeah, yeah and it, it's again it speaks to this danger on arrakis that things here are way more dangerous and uncomfortable than you are used to you soft squishy duke <laughs> <laughs> all right to wrap up our first takeaway here one last point we we want to make about the mysteries of Arrakis. And this one is huge. And I mean that literally. quite literally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's the worms, baby. The worms. How much, dear reader, do you know about the worms? Because that's about as much as Duke Leto and the Atreides know about the worms. It's true. And really how much anyone else knows about the worms. They're this giant mystery. They're this giant, honestly, sort of like, like Loch Ness Monster, you know, like people whisper about it and they talk about it and they're scared of it. And it, it is a reality. But unless you are a spice worker who goes out into the desert and faces one yeah, and maybe barely survives a scrape with a worm, most people probably go their entire lives never interacting with a worm or even seeing one. Obviously, at the end of this chapter, our main characters do see a worm in, the in frankly, a, a very dramatic fashion. Right. And Paul here is asking some really astute questions of Dr. Kynes. Yeah. And he realizes, like we do as the reader, that Dr. Kynes is hiding something. Yeah. He is dodging questions or answering them in a roundabout way for a very specific reason. And Dr. Kynes knows more than he is letting on. And Paul, being the sort of perceptive, highly trained and special child that he is, realizes that, quote, 
killing the worms would destroy the spice. He realizes that there must be a connection between two of the biggest mysteries on Arrakis, the worms and the spice. And to that point, this actually takes us to takeaway number two, which is Paul is special, but you know what? So is House Atreides. <laughs> because yeah. this isn't just the story of one exceptional kid from an otherwise unremarkable place. No, he is from an incredible house, which is unique in, in so many ways. And let's talk about some of the ways that become obvious throughout these last pages. Definitely. House Atreides is very different from the other houses we, we come across in the Dune series, primarily their rivals, the Harkonnens. And we know that part of the Emperor's reasoning for plotting with the Harkonnens to turn against Leto is that Duke Leto is very, very popular and increasingly becoming so among the other great houses. He poses a very real threat to Emperor Shaddam and to any of the houses that are allied with the Emperor. And so he wants to rid the world of a competitor. He wants to rid the world of Leto, and he doesn't want to lose the throne to a very popular Duke of House Atreides. Even though Leto doesn't want it. <laughs> like, we get a sense. Yeah. He's so tired as a Duke. He's nah, like dude. daydreaming about just flying away and fucking leaving the whole galaxy behind. Right, right. And the, the idea of Shaddam the Fourth being like, oh, he wants my throne. <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> Leto's like, I want a fucking nap, bro. I don't want to want to take the emperor. The, I don't want to take the empire, you idiot. I just want to see. The sleep. only thing I want is memory foam. <laughs> memory foam. Today's episode <laughs> sponsored by. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously, as we compare House Atreides to the other houses, or we kind of talk about how special it is, inevitably, we compare it most directly to the Harkonnens or the Harkonnens. But from this section, we actually do get multiple examples of how uncommon in the Imperium some of Duke Leto's sensibilities are in this kind of current era of Dune, right? Like, it's not just how bad are the Harkonnens and how good are the Atreides. It's really, the Atreides are unique in a lot of ways. And so to that point, you know, let's talk about their business of spice or kind of how the House Atreides handles spice. And in the staff meeting, Thufir Howitt, the Mentat, kind of provides a profits and equipment assessment, which... You do kind of get a sense that this wasn't always done very well by the Harkonnens, right? Like yeah. this, this like what things need to be repaired, what things need to be taken care of. No, that's not really the Harkonnen way. Um, but yeah. despite this, we do learn that the Harkonnens were bringing in 10 billion Solaris a year. Billion. 10 billion. That's so many more than the number of Fremen that Duncan Idaho approximated in that room. But <laughs> the Atreides are like, uh, we're not going to get that much, probably down at least a third. We're going to like hope to one day bring that back up, but it's going to be tough for a bit because we have all this shit that's like breaking down, you know? Right. The Harkonnens like took all the good equipment and left us with all the broken stuff. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of costs. Yeah. They haven't changed the oil in these rental cars for like 25 <laughs> years, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the tires exactly, are bald. Exactly. It's awful. Yeah. Yeah. So, some people might find this part of the chapter kind of boring and dry, but I was so fascinated. Oh, I was yeah. like, yes, tell me the tell me the economy <laughs> of Arrakis. Like, what's going on here? Yeah. Like, who's making the money? What, what are the trade deals? And this was this blew my mind when I was when I learned that the Harkonnens were making ten billion a year on Arrakis, bringing in ten billion Solaris, and the Atreides here, of course, are doing all these calculations, like how much do we need to pay our workers? And obviously, they pay their workers more than the Harkonnens did. They're figuring out how much equipment needs to be repaired, how much more equipment needs to be bought, and they're basically projecting that their profits will be significantly lower than what the Harkonnens were bringing in 
for a while until right. they can yeah. bring things back up to speed. Um, but I do also want to point out, I want to make it super clear. We spend most of Dune with very rich and powerful people. Yes. Yeah. A slightly lower profit margin than 10 billion Solaris <laughs> a year is yeah. still billions more <laughs> yeah. than the average person in the Dune universe is probably seeing every year. So to be clear, like we're still talking very rich, very powerful people. Like these are dukes. These are leaders of planets. These are politicians. And we're still talking about profits in the billions here. Right. But we see how Leto and the Atreides make those billions differently than the Harkonnens would. There's a great quote here where Duke Leto shows us just how differently he operates. He says, quote, we're working for a solid and permanent planetary base. We have to keep a large percentage of the people happy, especially the Fremen, end quote. That is something I can guarantee you, <laughs> Vlad, <laughs> never, yeah. you know, Baron Harkonnen, never once fucking said in his time leading Arrakis. <laughs> oh, yeah, never. Those words in that order? No, not Vlad. <laughs> so getting a sense of the business of Spice and the business of Arrakis was really interesting to me. And I think a great way to show how the Atreides are a different type of of people. They're a different kind of house. Sure, yes, there's an ulterior motive here, but it can't be argued that at the very least, Leto is going about running the planet in a, a fairly honorable way and is at least trying to keep, again, quote, a large percentage of the people happy. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, we have our observations, but we also get, I'm really grateful for the way that Frank constructed this, we get kinds kind of reflecting on internally this house atreides now he draws you know some very clear explicit comparisons and conclusions about leto and paul throughout this little section of him the ornithopter ride right we've got this quote a strange combination of softness and armed strength there was a poise to them totally unlike the harkonnens and of course we get to complete the fastest 180 in the literature history <laughs> the end of the chapter dr kynes is like damn i like this duke i like him i like this duke. he's great he's look at his beard wonderful <laughs> i like this dude yeah and again that speaks to leto's character which we're going to get to here in a second in our third takeaway but it speaks to how house atreides operates right. to them yeah it's important to protect their workers, their people, keep them happy, keep them fed, and that will breed loyalty. And I think that's a very different approach than House Harkonnen, who are very much about subjugation and control. It's two different outlooks to, to power and, and statecraft. Now, speaking of ruling and statecraft, it's by no means an easy job. Oh, yeah. And no. one of my favorite, favorite parts of not just this section that we're talking about on today's episode, but the entire book, actually, is that tiny, tiny, tiny chapter where Duke Leto and Paul are alone in that conference room. And, oh, boy, Leto just drops his guard. He lets the walls crumble and just opens up to his son, Paul, there. And it is it is a dark chapter that shows us so much of the struggles of being Duke. Right. I mean, he's clearly bitter about the, the perceived necessities, for example, of his propaganda corps, which he says is the best. Yeah, I love that line where he's like, how will they know I rule them well unless I tell them? You know, like, yes, uh, he's so bitter. And I also love, by the way, to Kynes is coming around. I love that his bitterness here about the propaganda corps and how much he hates that this is we, we had to we already have a new factory for propaganda materials. Like he's so angry about this. And then just just not even that long later, Kynes is also like, yeah, I've seen your propaganda, dude. And it's kind of a nice moment because having seen that moment of intimacy with Paul and Leto, you get a sense, okay, yeah, these guys really are 
pretty similar. They've got a similar yeah. mind to they're not about the marketing. They don't like the focusing on our we're trying to protect our brand image, you know? <laughs> right, right. That that showmanship. Like Leto resents it. Yeah. And he resents that he has to do it to be Duke. And another thing that he has to do as Duke, he brings up here in this chapter with Paul as well. The fact that he cannot marry the love of his life, the woman that's been with him, as we learned, for 16 years now. Yeah, it's crazy. The mother to his only son and heir, he cannot marry for political reasons. He is a rising star on the political stage. Like we've said, he's becoming increasingly popular among the other houses. He needs to remain a bachelor because that's leverage. Yeah. He could leverage his marriage for political gain in the future if he needed to. They need to keep that door open, that possibility open. And so him and Jessica don't get married as much as they love each other and as much as we, the reader, realize that Duke Leto would never, you know, oh, there's yeah. no other woman for this guy. He loves Jessica. And yet the necessities of statecraft, the necessities of being a leader require that he cannot call her wife, that he cannot marry her, and that he needs this option in his back pocket in case he needs to play that card. It's kind of heartbreaking. Not to mention, you know, when it comes to television in the Dune universe, The Bachelor, Ducal Edition, really the best <laughs> thing on TV. So <laughs> he's got to stay a Bachelor, man. I, what are they going to do for that season if he gets... No, can't do that. Right. Yeah. You got to bring the ratings in. Yeah. Kaiten. Nobody watches, nobody watches The Bachelor, Ducal Edition because... <laughs> They want to see a beautiful, happy 16-year marriage. That's boring as shit. And no one wants to see, like, the Duke of fucking Poritrin. Ugh. You know, we Ugh, want the Duke of on, Kaladin. Yeah. Ooh, he's sexy. Look at him. It's going to bring yeah. the ratings in. <laughs> right. Nobody wants the D-list Dukes, man. <laughs> now, we joke, obviously, about the Bachelor thing, but there is a certain level of, like, performative showmanship. Oh, yeah. When it comes to being Duke, I mean, again, in this chapter, nice pivot. Duke Leto says he wishes he could just run away. The guy is like literally dreaming of just leaving everything behind, leaving the empire, leaving his place as the Duke of House of Atreides. And he's just tired, Leo. We joked about it earlier, but our guy needs a nap. It's Dude, so clear that so he needs tired. a nap. He's so tired. And kind of taking this full circle back to our takeaway yeah. about House Atreides, this is the leader of House Atreides. This is who he is. And this is the kind of man that's leading this house. And frankly, this is kind of the type of person you want leading you, right? Yeah. Like there's that quote that the best people to lead are the ones who don't want to. Right. And it's very clear that Duke Leto doesn't want to lead. Or at le at the very least, hates some of the darker necessities of being a leader. And this chapter I just love so much because it just humanizes Duke Leto, especially after that conference scene where we see him being just sort of a cutthroat, clear-eyed, visionary leader in front of his people. Oh my gosh. Here yeah. he kind of breaks down and becomes just a normal human being who's just so, so tired. And I think that's something we can all relate to. I love that line where he's like, I need someone I can say these things to, son. Uh, you know? So sad. Ugh. And it's it, you're, it's so such a good point. You make a really good point. This juxtaposition of him in role, you know, on stage as Duke Leto Atreides. And then him here as the dad, the father, who's just... You know, he has to pop his anti-fatigue pill because he hasn't slept in like four days. Uh, and I say that like it's an exaggeration, but I think they actually say at some point how long he hasn't slept. And it's like a week. It's a long time. Yeah. Insane. Actually, Leo, we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves because true, we're already kind of talking about takeaway three. Our third and final takeaway for this section is that Duke Leto is a complex leader and father. I mean, the through line for these entire hundred pages is Duke Leto. 
We yeah. learned so much about him through him. We learned so much about House Atreides. And through him, we learn about the mysteries of Arrakis, which no one has ever thought to uncover. And now he finally is. So let's talk a little bit about the Duke himself as, as a leader and a father. It really can't be overstated how important Leto's character is in all of this. Whether we're talking about these hundred pages that we read or all of Dune, basically. Mm, and yeah. the better we understand him, the better we understand sort of the um, psychological platform or like kind of foundation of Paul. Like what? who is the man who for Paul is the ideal leader? Because very clearly yeah. he respects his dad and loves his dad and recognizes his dad's brilliance. So let's talk about not exactly his flaws, but definitely the side of him that we can't ignore and can't like gloss over idolizing the man. As nice as his beard is, <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's got these qualities too, right? Leto the Duke. He's shrewd. He is honorable and he's experienced, but at the end, he's a politician and he is also battling, viciously battling for survival in terribly like treacherous deadly violent system yeah yeah and we see that on full display here we see how desperate he is right on full display in these pages obviously his plan we've discussed this before obviously his plan to use and manipulate the fremen people don't like that word yeah <laughs> what a yeah what a grimy word but he he sort of openly admits to be that being kind of the plan here yeah and ironically enough, it sounds an awful lot like a Harkonnen tactic. Yeah. The Harkonnens totally. would manipulate a native people for their own personal gain. Right. Not the Atreides. Now, another way we see the Duke being cutthroat and kind of being this vicious politician is in the way that he directs Hawat during that conference meeting to take care of the Harkonnen spies that are still left on the planet. It, it's brilliant but it's also so savage. This is kind of a long quote, but I think it's worth I think it's worth saying here. Oh, it's so good. This is the direction that the Duke gives to Hawat at the meeting about those Harkonnen spies. Quote, I want you to forge certificates of allegiance over the signatures of each of them. File copies with the judge of the change. We'll take the legal position that they stayed under false allegiance. <laughs> Confiscate their property. Take everything turn out their families, <laughs> strip them, and make sure the crown gets its 10%. It must be entirely legal. End quote. What a, what a blow. What the fuck? Bro, that's crazy. It's so good. Again, that feels dirty and grimy. And it is. It's brutal. And the Duke is effective. I mean, this will get the job done and it'll be all completely above the board. And the crowd will get their 10%, so no one will ask questions. It's brilliant. It's also, it's worth saying here quickly, this word Conley has been said, I think at this point, two times, two or three times. Yeah. We are in Conley. It's a state of feudal war, effectively. It's like a war of attrition between two houses. So we talk about like a grudge and we talk about a rivalry and we talk about House Harkonnen and House Atreides being kind of at odds with one another, they are actually like formally declared in this sort of war of attrition. So it's kind of expected that they left spies behind. And it is expected that Duke Leto is going to do fucking anything he wants to these spies because that is the art of Conley. Absolutely. House Harkonnen and House Atreides are in the midst of Conley. They are in not so open warfare, right? Like you've mentioned this before, Leo, that in the world of Dune, outright sort of open warfare between two armies and like battleships in space shooting lasers at each other doesn't really happen right. because of the political nature of the empire. What happens is this, Conley, assassinations, spies, Forged threats. documents and stuff, yeah. Forged documents, right. right. Like, it, it's the uh, much more subtle warfare that's happening. But make no mistake, House Atreides and House Harkonnen are at war right now. And this is, a, this is just a war tactic that 
Duke Leto is employing against these spies. I will say a positive quality that we see on full display in the conference scene is that he's extremely observant. He's very astute. Right. And he can swallow his pride. We see that tense, tense interaction with Stilgar take place. Right. And on multiple occasions, he swallows his pride. When Stilgar spits on the table, he's quick to think, wait a second. This is not an insult. This means something different in Fremen culture. When Stilgar doesn't address him properly, or even later when Dr. Kynes doesn't address him properly, he's like, it's okay. These people don't know our ways. We don't know their ways. We need to make for some allowances. Right. And so he's he's quick to at least swallow his pride when it's required, when it's when it's a delicate matter where he doesn't want to offend a Fremen or he doesn't want a situation to go awry politically. He's quick to let his pride go and is sharp witted enough to know how to steer a political situation. So he, it's it's a mixed bag when when we're talking about this side of Leto, this side that is the politician, that is the leader, the Duke. There's good and there's bad there. Oh, totally. He's also, as it turns out, a complex man and father. <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> he, you know, clearly loves deeply, deeply, deeply his partner, his concubine, Jessica, and his son, Paul. And God, that it's so effective, that repetition of the, they have tried to take the life of my son just over and over and over again. It's this kind of repeating mantra in his head because yeah. he can't like swallow the rage. He just can't talk himself out of it. And though on an outward appearance, you know, he pats the propaganda guy in the arm. He's like talking to Gurney like, hey, you know, bribe some of those guys downstairs, you know, and play him some music, you know. The whole time he's got this record going, they have tried to take the life of my son. And oh, it's so it's so powerful and visceral. And there's that whole section where he's you know, he sets Paul aside and says, I have to do a hateful thing. I have to do this terrible thing. You know, I have to basically be mean to your mom. And it's the last thing in the world that I ever want to do. But, right, you know, you have to promise me you're going to tell her if uh, if I die that I never once doubted her. Like, that's it's just clearly he loves Jessica to the bottom of his heart. You know, he says, I would just as soon doubt myself right? Mm -hmm. When he's talking to uh, Thufir, it's incredible. It's so powerful to, to, to hear some of these thoughts coming from him because he really does love them. Right. And so many of them are in stark contrast to the cool collected persona we see of him as Duke. Right. The man, the man beneath is just as scared and worried as anyone would be in his situation. It's really, really heartbreaking to see. I mean, there are moments where we are inside his head that moment where he's looking out over Arrakis for example yeah and he's just missing his home he's missing Kaladin his home planet and realizing that he may never see Kaladin again yeah House Atreides has been on planet Kaladin for 10,000 years for generations and he is one of the first Atreides to leave it behind for this like <laughs> awful brutal <laughs> desert planet did you see the brochure it's just sand yeah, it's just sand <laughs> and so he's he's legitimately he's sad here he's scared and terrified of this uncertain future ahead of him ahead of his family and ultimately we realize that he's also bitter he's kind of bitter about the fate that he's been handed and these are all very normally human emotions. You cannot blame him for feeling any of these things. And if anything, these little windows into his soul humanize him as a character for us. He's not just this big, grand duke. He is a person with a ton of responsibility who hasn't slept in a week. <laughs> He's just popping these, like, caffeine pills, which it's can't be good pills. for you. <laughs> yeah. And, like, my dude's tired and he's sad and, like, ah, you just feel for him here. You want him to just take a break. But you know he can't. He's, he's got to fight to survive here. Yeah. 
And to really round out this third takeaway of ours, this idea that Leto is multifaceted and complex and he's got good in him, he's got bad in him, there's some things he's got to do by necessity. At the end of the day, he genuinely feels regret and remorse for many of the decisions that he is forced to make as Duke. My interpretation of his character is that at the end of the day, he's an honorable man stuck in a very dishonorable position yeah. in a very dishonorable system. There's a great quote uh, near the end of that chapter with Paul where he says, quote, to hold Arrakis, one is faced with decisions that may cost one his self-respect, end quote. Ugh. And that's truly how Duke Leto feels in this position right now. Man, yeah. What a what a complex father and leader. <laughs> but those are our main three takeaways from this section, right? Number one, again, Arrakis, full of secrets. No one knows jack shit about it. There are eagles. <laughs> Shocker. Paul is special, and so is House Atreides. And then finally, of course, Leto as the head of House Atreides is a complex father and leader. All righty, we're going to keep this conversation going, but first, a quick break. And now, my uh, kind of my favorite part, although I love all of yeah. this, I love all of this. My favorite part, let's talk about some lightning round fun little things we noticed. And as always, there's so much more to talk about than time to talk. This episode's already very long. <laughs> so uh, we're just going to. We're just going to go through these. Right. So let's jump into our lightning round lore tidbits. Yeah. First up, we have the Hunter Seeker. Yeah. This deadly <laughs> little tool is a fascinating piece of Dune technology. So as pointed out, it floats on a compact Holtzman suspensor field. Yes. Which is the same thing that makes other things in the Dune universe float, like the glow globes, those lightning bulbs that are floating around. Right, right. And it's small. I mean, yeah. in the book, it's described as no more than five centimeters. Now, a little bit of background on the Hunter Seeker. This has been a longtime secret weapon among the houses, but it was first used by House Carino, who kept it under wraps for a very long time until it was sort of publicly revealed that Hunter Seekers are a thing when <laughs> Emperor Elrude IX, who was the previous emperor before Shaddam, attempted to kill his son, the current <laughs> Emperor Shaddam, with a Hunter Seeker. And Shaddam decided, you know what? I'm going to make this public. And thus, the Hunter Seeker became a very common tool of assassination and espionage among other great houses. Thanks for that, House Carino. <laughs> God, talk about father-son relationships, not like Leto and Paul. <laughs> Assassination <laughs> yeah. attempts between father and son. Love them. <laughs> the next bullet point here, the next sort of nugget takeaway, are those beautiful, luscious ruby lips. Get it, mentats. Oh my God. So, oh my God. <laughs> Thufir Hawat is described multiple times in this section as having sappho stained lips, these sort of ruby red stained lips. And this is actually common among mentats who drink a rare substance called juice of Sappho or juice of Sappho, as I've heard some people pronounce it. And hilariously, it's described as they claim it boosts their mental capacities, <laughs> which, again, just it's like, yeah, I claim drinking beer makes me a better skateboarder. Doesn't mean that it does, <laughs> but sure, sure makes them more confident, you know, or they, I just like to picture them doing shots of Sappho. Anyway. Point is, it stains their <laughs> lips and teeth kind of this red color. And we talked about in the nuggets of last episode, the last book club, we talked about Ikazian plant life and art, you know, the, the fogwood sculptures that reflect people's emotions, that sort of thing. Juice of Sappho is actually also a product of Ikaz. It's a, uh, an Ikazian barrier root, uh, which is then kind of distilled down to this fluid and there's an amount there's a ratio that i can't remember at this time but it's it's a lot it takes a lot of roots to make a little bit of sappho juice so it's clearly very very delicious and worth it <laughs> worthwhile 
And <laughs> these barrier roots are near the craters left from atomics on the planet. Because if you haven't heard our Planet ECAS episode, the planet's got a long and very radioactive history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of nukes going off on that planet, for sure. Indeed. All right, lore tidbit number three. Yes. We get a lot of vehicles in these pages. Indeed. We get mentions of spice harvester factories and carry-all wings and ornithopters and sand crawlers. These are all very important vehicles that come into play in the Dune universe. Now, a fun little reminder on those ornithopters, which are effectively just helicopters. Flappy but, helicopters. <laughs> uh, yeah, flappy yeah. helicopters um, is how I picture them for sure. But if you look in the Dune Encyclopedia, yeah. it stated that ornithopters actually use a 300-pound heart mollusk as their primary engine to <laughs> flap those big flappy wings. And yeah. the jets are actually just used for takeoff and landing. There's some dubious lore info in the encyclopedia and a, right. you know it's up to debate whether it's entirely canon so take that as you will but kind of interesting to think that at the heart of these ornithopters might be a giant mollusk that's flapping those wings <laughs> okay moving on from the heart mollusks as much as it pains me to do so let's talk about drugs <laughs> yes drugs my favorite so we talked about some of the akazian drugs on the last book club uh, but today, we actually got some references to more kind of commercial, mundane substances. And we see anti-fatigue tablets, which is kind of fun. Duke Leto is taking these in exchange of never sleeping. But also, at the beginning of the staff meeting, they mentioned this Rachag stimulant, or Rachag stimulant. And this, from the terminology of the Imperium, is, quote, a caffeine-type stimulant from the yellow berries of acarso, which is a plant from silkoon with, quote, almost oblong leaves. So it's basically coffee. <laughs> it's like, I imagine like caffeine pills. Like, I, it doesn't sound like they drink it necessarily. It's, it's maybe administered in some other way. And it makes sense then why there's this smell of Rachag stimulant when they come in. And the first thing our like charismatic good leader duke leto says is hey y'all there's some coffee if you want it <laughs> they're all like yes please <laughs> we're tired of this ratchet stimulant it's amazing i love that right. those little details are great yeah now our final little detail that we want to call out is about our boy gurney halleck love him we did an entire spoiler free episode about the life of gurney halleck yeah. he leads an incredible life before these first pages of Dune where we meet him. And in this section, there are some really interesting references to that past life. Uh, some things that stick out. There's a quote where Gurney says, quote, serving two masters. It sounds like a religious quotation. And then the Duke replies, and you should know. Now, that could be a nod to Gurney's personal faith, but there is another possibility because if you know about Gurney's life, you know that at one point, he swore allegiance to House Atreides with a huge caveat right. that he was going to prioritize finding his lost and abducted sister. Right. So in a way, he had two allegiances, one to House Atreides and one to his family, to his sister. Now, fast forwarding a bit to the Ornithopter ride, Gurney Halleck serenades us with a couple of his iconic songs. Yeah. And once again, if you know about Gurney's life, you know that music is central to who he is. Yeah. Music is the thing that protected him and saved him during a brutal 10-year period in his life where he was captured by the Harkonnens and thrown in their slave pits. And despite the hardships that Gurney has been through in his life, he's still one of the most effective and trusted advisors of Duke Leto. Leto comments to Kynes at one point where he talks about how multi-talented Gurney is. Quote, Gurney's one of a kind. I like him with me for his eyes. His eyes miss very little. One of a kind indeed. <laughs> Gurney one Halleck. of a kind. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, as, as we concluded in our Gurney Halleck episode, 
My man fucks. <laughs> fucks. And that's canon. It's and no one can take canon. that away. <laughs> and that wraps it up for us, Leo. That's it. We did it. Woo! Another book club episode <laughs> in the books. I mean, listen, we got through an assassination attempt. We got to see a sandworm eating a spice harvester factory, which, may Ooh. I point out, few have ever seen. And mm -hmm. we heard the sweet, sweet voice of Gurney, man of many talents, one of a kind, Halleck. Oh, mm -hmm. so good. So good. What an incredible set of chapters. And personally, I cannot wait to hear what our listeners think about these pages. Oh, my God. Yeah. Now, looking to the future for the next book club episode, here's what you need to know. We'll be reading through page 324 in our paperback copies of the book. Now, if you have a different copy of the book, the sentence you'll want to read up to is, quote, and he felt the tears coursing down his cheeks. Uh, Ooh, that sends shivers down my spine. What could that be? Oh, my gosh. I don't know. We'll have to read and find out. Exactly. So you have two weeks before the next Dune Book Club episode to read up until that sentence or up until page 324. And I can't wait. Can't wait. Well, friends, there is no real ending. It's just the place where you stop the recording. But this podcast is always one step beyond logic. So help spread the word of Muad'Dib and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And be sure to check out the other shows on the Lore Party Podcast Network on loreparty.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at lore underscore party. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, he who controls the podcast controls the universe. We'll see you on the golden path. Before we meet him in these pages, in the... Fuck me, dude. <laughs> I'm so tired. I need some of those fatigue pills. <laughs> need some of that ratchet. Can't track. talk. <laughs> Getting ratchet on ratchet.